Welcome everybody to another lecture. Today's unit is maintain the quality of perishable items. The unit code is SITX INV002. Um, we'll be going through all of the slides today. So if you need to pause anywhere in this lecture recording, you're free to do so. If you have any confusion or need to revise any sections, you can replay this recording at any time. We will be going through all the lectures, so that means we'll be doing the activities as well. So once we reach the activities, you're more than welcome to pause if you need more time. And you may, um, you know, can come back to the section when you are free. Um, this lecture will be in your student portal, so you can revisit it any time you'd like. Alright, let's get going. So, store supplies in appropriate conditions. 1.1. Conduct temperature checks on delivered goods, ensuring they are within specified tolerances. So, if you're getting dry goods, you essentially want to make sure that are, you know, they're to room temperature, they're not too hot, and they're not too humid. If you are getting frozen items, you know, you want them to be below negative 10 degrees. If they're in the freezer, you'd want them to be below negative 18. And if you're getting, you know, fridge or something that needs to be cool, raw foods or anything that's cooked and been fro uh, like maybe is cool and been put in the fridge, you want them to be below five degrees um, Celsius. So conducting temperature checks, it will be necessary to conduct temperature checks upon the delivery of goods to your premises in order to ensure that they have been kept within specified tolerances and don't pose a risk to your customers. You will have to closely inspect the supplies and decide whether they are suitable for acceptance or rejection. So meaning if they're not suitable you'd need to essentially fill out a report but you need to make that judgment. If it's spoiled or if you think that the temperature has been below you need to tell the delivery driver straight away. You, you can't just accept that at a you know a less desired temperature or it might look a bit odd or smell a bit odd so you need to let the delivery driver know. You may perform spot checks of refrigerated delivery trucks to ensure that they have been maintained at the appropriate temperature so if you you know if you're really confused about your product you might go and check their truck and their temperatures in the truck um, because sometimes it does fluctuate depending on how long they've been um, you know, um, on the street or being transported, depending on the day, how hot is it, how cold is it, things like that. Um, discussing acceptable delivery temperatures with a business that delivers food to your companies and formally agreeing that the food will be delivered frozen or chilled or hot or within safe time limits. So we don't want it in the danger zone. So our items we want four degrees or less obviously we don't want it five degrees and up and if it's being hot or warm we want it above um, well above 60 is the desired but I would say if it's above 78 you won't have any bacteria growth okay um, all right so if you're thinking about um, if your food should be frozen you can check it when it is delivered to your business to make sure that it is frozen and it has begun to thaw if food should not be chilled or hot, um, you check um, the temperature of the food when it is delivered to your business and make sure that it is at uh, below 5 degrees or above 60. So that's the danger zone range, you don't want to be there. If food should be delivered within safe time limits, you should check the records of delivery departure and arrival times to ensure that the delivery took place within the agreed time limit you need to check every food item or relevant delivery record but you should check some items to make sure that the supplier is doing the right thing alright so we're at activity 1a what are the specified tolerances for chilled and frozen food um, so essentially if it's chilled you want it if you're accepting it um, you want it below 5 degrees celsius and for frozen foods you want to make sure that it hasn't started thawing if it has how long for and if it is frozen and you are accepting that 
they need to be below negative 18 degrees so then if it's above 10 yeah negative 10 then the center might have already started to defrost you know so you don't know um, what the temperatures might be essentially so if it's frozen you want to be negative 18 if it's chilled you know below 5 degrees if it's hot food you want it above 60 so I would suggest above 75 or 78 degrees when you're um, storing it or accepting it All right, identify four steps that may be taken to ensure supplies are delivered to your premises within specified tolerances so first of all we can um, you know get in touch with our supplier and make sure that we have an agreement in place that whatever food that they will supply if it's hot food it might be given to us at a temperature range above 60 if they are giving us chilled food it must be at a temperature range below 5 degrees Celsius and if they're giving us frozen food it must be at a range below negative 18 degrees if they're giving us um, dry goods it must be at you know roughly 18 to 20 degrees with low humidity <coughs> another thing is you can check um, drivers logs so when they've left um, their supplier how long it's been on the road uh, you can check do spot checks on the delivery truck and see what the temperatures are on the truck you can also um, you know uh, call the supplier and ask them you know how long just to verify how long it's been outside for uh, you can also make sure whenever you're getting things delivered that you're checking the temperatures when they are getting delivered to you you can also check the quality how it is looking the smell um, check the um, the expiry dates, the best before dates before you accept it. If you don't think that it's at an acceptable uh, range or temperature or quality you need to reject that delivery and send it back. Make sure you sign the invoice saying that you reject it and take proof. So send an email off straight away to the supplier. <clears throat> take photos of the damaged products, send that off to them so you have proof why you've sent it so they don't get to charge you for those supplies alright so complete those activities when you're done come back and we can resume with the lecture <coughs> 1.2 record temperature results according to organizational procedures you will be expected to take regular readings of food temperatures and make adjustments to your fridges freezers as necessary it would be advisable to take these readings at at least two times each day. The food storage equipment should be labeled and you will need to consider the appropriate temperatures which should be maintained to avoid buildup of any potentially harmful bacteria. So um, <clears throat> if we store items in the danger zone with high moisture, most likely you'll get a lot of multiplication of bacteria. So if we're keeping hot foods, we want to be keeping it out of 60 degrees or higher, meaning, you know, I would suggest having it above 78 degrees. Um, if we are um, having chilled food um, that we put in the freezer, we would say below 5 degrees Celsius. If it's frozen, obviously below 18 degrees, negative 18 degrees. Details that may, may be included on the temperature recording forms. So on the form you'll have the number of the fridge or freezer because you might have multiple fridges or freezers or cool rooms, whatever it might be. Day of the week and time. Um, nature of food checked. Temperature readings. The corrective action that's needed and necessary that needs to be taken. Alright, so activity 1B. Identify five details that should be taken when recording temperature results in accordance with organizational ex, um, expectations. So in my organization, first of all, we want to identify where we're checking. So if we're checking in the dry storage or if we're checking, um, you know, in the fridge one, 
freezer two, cool room one, whatever it might be. We want to identify what equipment we're checking or Bain Marie two, whatever. We want to <coughs> identify the time. We want to identify the date. We want to identify the location of, a, of where that equipment is located. Okay, then we want to include the items that we've checked. We want to um, have a record of how many times we've checked it. So we want to record at least a minimum of two times a day. So I usually come in at the start of the day and just do temp temperature checks on the fridges, look at the thermometers and pick out a, a large box with food because essentially if we pick out something small it's more likely that it will hold temperature because it's a small item but the larger item might not in the center so we would use a um, you know a thermometer insert it and check the core of that box or that item and as it is larger if it's giving us a higher temperature reading that means there's something wrong with the the fridge or freezer if if it's a freezer and I can put the thermometer, the probe thermometer in the in the meat, it's kind of um, worrying because I shouldn't be able to. It should be frozen. So, yeah, we got to check those things. Um, yeah, so checking the temperatures, how many times we've checked it, and any uh, issues that we might have faced. So it could be lower temperatures or anything like that. And how did we solve those problems, essentially. So... Uh, I know it says five, but you want to have those things there. So essentially, um, what equipment, where you are, the time you've checked it, the date, um, what item, uh, the temperatures that you've found it at, the... Um, any issues and and if there were any issues how did you solve them okay all right so complete that and then when you're ready come back and we can resume and move to the next one 1.3 identify deficiencies with delivered food items and reject supply within scope of responsibility or report findings so identifying deficiencies you will be expected to closely inspect any food that is delivered to your business premises and identify any deficiencies. It should be possible to reject any food that you deem to be unsafe and arrange fresh supplies. Any chilled food should be delivered at a temperature of under 5 degrees centigrade or Celsius. You should also ensure that any frozen food is in a solid state and hasn't begun thawing, so defrosting. Other deficiencies that may be included or identified such as damaged packaging, food that is past the best before or used by dates, raw and ready to eat food that hasn't been separated, food that hasn't been labeled properly, food deliveries combined with chemicals and other substances which may pose a risk, and hot food delivered at temperatures under 60 degrees Celsius. To reject supply may involve rejecting supply immediately on delivery by supplier rejecting supply of goods delivered under concession and not formally received and quarantining contaminated food from other food until the rejection is finalized returning food to the supplier disposing of contaminated food with consent of the supplier Activity 1C. Give five examples of deficiencies which may be identified when inspection delivered food items. Okay, so when we're uh, inspecting foods um, and we want to look for deficiencies, we're best, you know, first of all, temperatures, right? If it's a chilled item, we want to make sure it's five degrees or below. If it's a frozen item, we want to make sure that is um, below negative 18. If it's a hot item, we want to make sure it is above 60, and my recommendation would be that it's above 78 degrees, um, and out of that danger zone. If we're looking at dry goods, we're then making sure that it is at a two room temperature, the item is not sweating, you know, there's not too much humidity in the packet, 
Um, then if we're looking at packaging, we need to make sure that it's not ripped or damaged. If we're looking at the best before dates, we're making sure that there is a good enough range, not that it is expiring tomorrow. We're making sure that the, um, if we're, let's say, taking any items um, that haven't been contaminated, meaning such as, you know, if you're taking raw and cooked food, that they haven't been put together in any sort of way. Um, if we're taking any items that maybe look too generic or maybe not labeled well enough, um, maybe they've been you know tampered with or there might be something fishy going on if you feel like there is some sort of doubt with the product if they've given you the wrong brand or maybe it looks like that it's not what you regularly order you want to send that away if you're not confident with it um, other things could be you know if it were let's say the packaging was damaged or if it was um, you know brought and delivered with if it was food items they were delivered with chemicals you know so they were getting cross contaminated or maybe those food items now smell like soap or whatever okay so include all of those in that activity once you've completed that come back and unpause and we can move on to the next one Right, 1.4. Choose and prepare correct environmental conditions for the storage of perishable supplies. So choosing and preparing environmental conditions, right? So it will be necessary to follow the manufacturer's instructions. This will, you know, most likely be on the product itself. If they come with labels, it will tell you what they recommend, how to store it, where to store it, lighting conditions, temperatures, humidity, all those kind of things. So relating to the periods of time that the particular foods may be kept in the storage and the temperatures that it should be maintained, you must maintain reasonable separation between cold foods in the refrigerator to allow cold airflow. It would be advisable to identify the coldest and warmest areas of your fridge for the appropriate storage of different perishable supplies. So <clears throat> I would say if you've got um, a normal fridge right the highest part of your fridge um, because hot air rises would be the coldest uh, meaning sorry the the highest part of your fridge would be the warmest and the more you go near the vents um, to the bottom that's where you would find the coldest air because cold air usually tends to drop um, yeah, so once you've identified that, you can plan out where you're going to put things and um, how you're going to store them accordingly. Alright, um, the following foods should be refrigerated. So foods with use-by dates, food which has been designed for refrigeration, um, food that has been cooked but is not expected to be served immediately or consumed immediately. Uh, ready to eat food including cooked meats and salads. The period of safe storage may depend on the quality, freshness of the food delivered to the premises, storage of products before delivery, temperatures of fridges and freezers, and nature of items that are stored. Freezing and alternative storage. You should ensure that frozen food is immediately transferred to the freezer upon delivery. It will be necessary to wrap any raw and ready to eat food and maintain separation for the avoidance of cross-contamination. You will have to attach date labels to fresh food before freezing so that such foods are consumed with reasonable time frames. You will be expected to keep some fresh fruit and vegetables in a cool room. So if you guys don't have a cool room, the op obviously the alternative is a fridge. Um, if you've got dry goods, you would be storing it in a you know, less humid area where it's much cooler, there's less light that can cause damage to your foods, things like that. All right, give four examples of foods that should be refrigerated. So <clears throat> we're looking at ready to eat meals, 
or food that has been um, you know cooked and but is not you know uh, is not going to be served immediately you could be also you know things that the manufacturer has recommended that be stored in the fridge the then we've got items that are or have um, expiry dates or best before dates things like that you could have um, you know things such as dairy you could more like you know cheese or milk um, what else I would say you, you could have fresh vegetables depending on how long you intend to use them um, you could say you know if you're thawing items meaning defrosting items you could put them in the refrigerator to defrost instead of having them outside so you could have a much safer defrosting process than um, having them defrost in the open air, having them you know, have a lot of bacteria build up and things like that. It will take longer, but it's much safer. So you can plan ahead a lot longer. Um, but essentially, if you don't intend to cook that straight away, I would recommend the fridge method of defrosting than the open air or underwater defrosting method. I wouldn't really recommend using a microwave to defrost. It just... Um, it changes the way that the item you know has moisture content because microwaves affect the moisture the water that's in there so it will change how it kind of feels and acts and it essentially dehydrates the item as well All right, identify four factors that have been bearing uh, have a bearing on the period of safe storage so if you're <coughs> thinking about that um, you've got to think about the quality, the freshness, the time that has, it's been in transport or it's been defrosting. Um, you are also thinking about the where you're going to be putting it, if it's going to be put in the right conditions, such as you know your dry storage or your freezer, fridge, whatever it might be. You're also thinking about um, the best before and expiry dates. So if if you don't have a long enough time um, to store these items in a uh, you know your preferred storage area, then there's no point taking that food. And if you're talking about frozen foods, you don't want to have one thing on top of the other you want to have good circulation of air in that freezer so all of the frozen or that cold you know freezing air is surrounding the item all right so complete those activities once you're done come back and unpause and we can move on to the next one okay uh, 1.5 date code perishable supplies to maximize their use so date coding perishable supplies Australian law specifies the need for all packaged food with shelf lives of less than two years to have use by dates on the primary packaging other types of supplies should be coded with a best before dates it is also a legal requirement for retailers to place date codes on secondary packaging for the purpose of stock rotation and the minimize of wastage it is absolutely essential to ensure that supplies will, um, you know with use by dates are consumed prior to the expiration so you're not still using them after the use by date So these perishable foods should have use by dates, dairy produce, meat produce, ready prepared salads and prepared fish. Stock rotation labels. It is common practice to use um, purpose made stock rotation labels. They can be attached to containers and raw food supplies. There are a variety of details that may be included on these labels including the date of storage 
and expected shelf life of different foods. They may also indicate which foods should be selected first as they are nearing expiry. So identify three types of perishable foods that should have use-by dates. Um, so if we're talking about three types, we've got um, ready-to-eat meals such as salads, um, we've got meat produce, dairy produce, and you know um, specified seafood that they've cut up or prepared and then essentially packaged um, so yeah whatever's be any any items that have been you know kind of messed with or cut or prepared or you know cooked or you know anything that you can essentially think about it being transformed for from its original you know point I guess um, then you want to have uh, use by dates on them All right so how do best before dates relate to consumption of perishable foods so if we're talking about relations of best before dates um, essentially the best before date is telling you when it has its ultimate, you know, um, uh, ultimate quality date. It's not that the best before means that it is expired. You can still consume that item if it's past the best before date, um, but you can't consume it after the used by date, right? So if you are considering, let's say, a salad and it has a best before date which is today um, most you know suppliers might put a special or lower the price on it because they can't sell it tomorrow so they want to sell it off today but maybe um, it's still good it's just not as um, maybe the lettuce is not as crisp as it was two days ago compared to um, you know what it will be tomorrow maybe the expiry date is two days forward so it can still be eaten in the next day or two, but it just won't have that um, best quality that you're looking for. All right, so uh, complete that activity. Once you're done, come back and we can resume to the next one. 1 1.6, promptly store supplies in appropriate storage area to minimize wastage and avoid food contamination. You should plan and implement appropriate processes for the storage of perishable supplies in order to minimize wastage and avoid food contamination. It would be advisable to label such supplies as soon as they are delivered to your premises. The label should specify the nature of ingredients, expiry, and instructions relating to the handling and storage of supplies. Food wastage may include ingredients that are left over during the preparation stage, food that is produced in quantities that are too large, oversized portions which prompt customers to leave leftovers, um, food that spoils or goes out of date due to poor stock rotation or production quality. Contamination may occur when cooked product is contaminated by raw product. Edible product is contaminated by waste. Product, people or equipment that have been in contact um, with products is moved between food handling areas. All right, areas of your fridge where particular ingredients should be kept. So upper shelf, we're looking at milk, fruit juice and other chilled beverages. Middle shelves, we're thinking of cakes, fish, yogurt, and deli meat and cheese the lower shelf we've got leftover meat hard vegetables and berries the bottom drawer we got fruit soft vegetables lettuce and vacuum packaged supplies and fridge door we've got dairy products eggs and defrosted ingredients so give four examples of scenarios involving food wastage so if we're taking into consideration maybe um, you know, if we're thinking about cooked product, 
being contaminated by raw product so the raw product is leaking juices onto the cooked product um, if maybe some sort of waste the next one would be some sort of waste touching um, a edible product meaning we can't wash it or clean it so now it's been contaminated and we now ultimately can't serve it because there's contamination then we've got you know um, cross contamination of other products that have gone into so maybe seafood has gone into chicken and you there might be an issue there or you could have allergies you know maybe nuts have gone into the rice now there's um, nut particles present in the rice so you can't serve it to someone with that allergy um, you know and the finally you could have um, product or people you know cross you know going between one area to the next and cross contaminating each other all right so identify three instances in which food contamination may occur so if we're giving up the four examples for food wastage we'd be thinking about um, ingredients that are left over during the preparation stage uh, food that is produced you know in large quantities so you essentially you're not serving it and then ultimately you're not selling it so you have to throw it away as it gets um, you know older and older and no one's consuming it so you have to throw it oversized portions so meaning customers leave leftovers and then any spoils or any food that goes off because you haven't done the stock rotation properly or have taken um, you know bad quality products from your supplier and did not notice so things like that all right so now we're on to specify the areas of your fridge where the following supplies should be kept so essentially um, we're looking at this chart here if we're looking at the fruit juice we want it on the upper shelf if we're looking at yogurt so, so it's a dairy product it could be on the fridge door or in the upper shelf as well uh, if we're looking at hard vegetables we're going for the lower shelf if we're going for soft vegetables we're going for the bottom drawer and if we're going for defrosted ingredients we want to essentially keep it on the uh, l lowest um, shelf with a pan underneath so it catches all the juices of that defrosting so it's not um, you know going on and leaking so you could also put it if it's small enough you can put it on the fridge door as well alright so now um, once you have that completed come back and we can move on to the next one so 2.1 regularly check and adjust environmental conditions of all storage areas and equipment to maintain perishable supplies at optimum quality so food safety standards specify that the following requirements of food business must when storing food store the food in such a way that it is protected from the likelihood of contamination and the environmental conditions under which it is stored will not adversely affect the safety and suitability of the food items so a food business must when storing potential hazardous food store it under temperature control if it is um, the food is intended to be frozen ensure the food remains frozen during storage Signs of faulty fridges and freezers include food becoming partially frozen or remaining warm after being placed in the fridge. Substantial quality, uh, quantities of ice building on the fridge walls. Melting ice in the freezer. Supplies become spoilt before the specified expiry date. And condensation accumulating inside the fridge. Protecting supplies from spoilage. There are a number of steps that can be taken to extend the shelf life of perishable ingredients. You should be aware that the refrigeration of such ingredients will minimize the buildup of potentially harmful microorganisms and the production of enzymes which cause spoilage. You should also be aware that such microorganisms cannot accumulate on frozen food. 
to activity 2A. What do the food safety standards specify in relation to the storage of hazardous food? So if we're talking about the safety standard, so a food business must, when storing potential hazardous food, store it under temperature control. And if it is food that is intended to be stored frozen, ensure that the food remains frozen during storage. Right, identify four signs of faulty fridges and freezers. So you, you're finding condensation inside the fridge. Uh, your supplies become spoiled before the specified expiry date. Um, you could have ice in the freezer that is melting. Substantial quantities of ice building on the fridge walls. And food becoming partially frozen or remaining warm after being placed in the fridge for a long period of time. Alright, number three. What is the main reason for placing perishable supplies in the refrigerator? So, the main reason that we would put um, perishable supplies in the refrigerator is we want to have the longest um, storage time possible and we want to hold the quality of that item for the longest period possible. So, we're keeping that item in a fridge so that the buildup of microorganisms um, can be slowed or eliminated completely. So, if we're keeping it out of the 5 to 60 degree range, meaning the danger zone, um, it will essentially slow down all bacteria reproduction on the item and give you the best chance of keeping it uh, keeping that food item for the longest time. Um, so, essentially, the reason why we put perishable items in the fridge, and if the fridge is working properly, is to keep the quality for the longest time and slow down the reproduction of bacteria. And ultimately, eliminating it or keeping it from spoiling as long as possible. Alright, specify four ways of preserving perishable ingredients. So if we are um, freezing it, ultimately that is the best way if you're going to preserve it. But you don't want to preserve it for too long because then it will go into a state where it will start burning from the freezing. And the moisture will crystallize too badly so that it won't um, adjust with the item again. Uh, you know, you could you're putting it in the refrigerator um, you are you know vacuum sealing the product you are dating and labeling the product when you are receiving any new items that you are using the FIFO method meaning first in first out so you are using old ingredients and uh, putting the newer ingredients to the back if uh, we're thinking of the location if you're thinking about the item so we would pick an appropriate storage area if it's dry goods we would put it in the dry storage area with low humidity low light if we have something frozen we would pick a freezer and make sure that it is at least negative 18 degrees if we are chilling and putting it in the fridge we want to make sure the fridge is clean and below 5 degrees Celsius and essentially if we're having vegetables we'd want to put it in the specific area so it doesn't um, you know dry out the vegetable so yeah uh, complete those once you've done that come back and we can resume to the next points 2.2 2. conduct temperature checks according to food safety procedures and protect supplies from spoilage Protecting from damage of cross-contamination. You should be aware that there will be a risk of food poisoning if you don't protect your food supplies from cross-contamination. This might happen as a result of raw food, such as meat coming into direct contact with ready-to-eat food, equipment, and food preparation areas. However, you can reduce the risks by identifying the signs of contaminated food upon delivery 
and ensuring that it isn't transferred to your kitchen. The risk, uh, these food types pose a greater risk of cross-contamination. Raw meat, including beef and chicken, other raw foods, including fish, eggs, vegetables and fruit which aren't ready to eat. Health risks are posed by the following pests. Rodents such as mice and rats, insects including flies and cockroaches, birds and pests that are attracted to stored foodstuffs such as flour. So ants, um, you know, you could go into mites or any sorts of other small insects. Uh, deterring pests. Kitchen doors and windows should be kept securely closed whenever possible. You should also take time and care when cleaning food preparation areas. Small cracks and crevices should be covered as soon as they are identified. You will have to wash and sanitize utensils and cooking equipment regularly to prevent the buildup of bacteria. Alright, so activity 2B. Identify three main types of supplies that pose the greatest risk of cross-contamination. So, when we're thinking about cross-contamination, we're looking at... Um, you know, being aware of um, what food supplies you're handling. So, if there are any risks of food poisoning, you should protect your food supplies from that cross-contamination. Um, if we're thinking about um, raw foods or, you know, having direct contact with ready-to-eat foods, we want to separate them as much as possible. We want to have raw items on the lower shelves and cooked items on higher shelves. Um, we can also reduce the risk um, of contamination, especially in the delivery phase and storing phase. To be careful, use gloves, uh, make sure that the product is sealed and dated when we are doing those as well. Alright, so detailed three measures that may be taken to minimize the risk of cross-contamination. So if we're thinking about cross-contamination, we are going to essentially make sure that we're not really um, you know handling foods and you know from one separate item to another we're not going from let's say when we are doing preparation we're not going from marinating chicken and then using the same gloves and going to marinate um, you know the uh, the chicken or for sorry the seafood you know what I mean so we want to be changing our areas we want to be making sure we have new gloves all those kind of things wearing the right PPE uh, we're also making sure that we have no pests we're making sure that our waste area is different from our preparation area we're making sure that any chemicals that we might have in the workplace um, is in a different area maybe on the lower racks from our preparation area so that and you know nothing can drop from the top um, yes so there's heaps of them um, number three specify six ways of defrost uh, deterring pests from your premises so if you're thinking about pests um, you know doing um, you know you essentially want to have proper uh, pest control done regularly you want to have all your windows and doors closed you want to make sure that all your dry storing goods are packaged properly and are not you know, left open so pests are drawn by the smell or that um, that they can get into so then and they can breed you want to have as less um, corners and crevices as possible meaning so that they can't get into like rats or cockroaches can't get into the corners and start breeding and if you do have corners and crevices you want to have nice gaps so you can get into those corners and give them a proper clean okay um, yeah essentially doing your pest control making sure windows and um, your you know any doors are closed properly 
making sure that you're not leaving out any items, making sure whatever items are in your dry areas are sealed properly, making sure your fridge doors are sealed properly, freezer doors, cool room doors, whatever, any way that they can come in and be sealed properly. Um, what else? You could also you know, have a good hygiene process in your workplace. So whenever you're using equipment you wanna clean it properly, sanitize it, any of your cleaning areas you wanna make sure that you're cleaning it properly, drying it out, making sure that there's no mold build up or um, you know, making sure there's always movement so there's not flies coming in you might have a buzzer, like an electric buzzer, insect buzzer, um, or shocker, meaning that you know it's ultraviolet light which they're attracted to. Instead of coming onto your food, they'll go into that specified location that you clean regularly. Things like that. There's so many. All right. So include your ideas as well. Once you're done there, come back and we can move on to the next one. So 2.3, protect supplies from damage of cross-contamination and pests and 2.4, rotate perishable supplies for maximum use according to expiration dates. So you should adopt um, first in first out principle, so rotating perishable supplies. We want to be thinking about FIFO. Whenever we get new sto um, stock, we want to put it behind the old stock so that we don't use the new stock and forget about the old. So this will involve moving the older supplies to the front of your shelves and the new ones to the back. It will maximize the chances of using perishable supplies before they expire. It will be necessary to identify the expiry dates and arrange your storage areas accordingly. These measure, uh, measures should be taken um, so checking perishable supplies on delivery and placing them behind existing stock as necessary, conducting regular checks of older stock to ensure that it isn't showing signs of deterioration or pests haven't gone into it or started biting it, uh, discarding expired stock and rearranging the storage areas regularly. Rotating perishable supplies, you should adopt the first in first out method like we said before. Um, you know, if we are um, um, discarding the stock, we want to make sure we're rearranging the stock area. So now that we're up to activity 2C, what is the first in, first out stock rotation system and why should it be applied? So FIFO, or first in, first out, is a process which uh, helps us to um, rotate the stock and make sure that we use the oldest stock first and the newest stock last. Um, this enables our products to be regularly you know checked and be used with the highest quality and not you know forget about the stock that we have and keep using the new ones. This allows us to have less spoilage and less waste for the business, meaning we can save more money. Um, also, it allows us to put more care into our products. So if we haven't touched an item for a long time, we might forget and then cockroaches or rats might get into it, ultimately, you know, deteriorating that product. So if we have frequent movement, rearranging the rooms and things like that, we may, you know, essentially keep pests away because there is so much movement. Usually you'll see more pests where there is less movement. Okay, So first in first out, FIFO system, we're rotating our stock when we receive new stock, meaning we put the old stock into the front of the shelf and the new stock to the back. And the reason why we do it is so that we keep our quality high of our products and that we don't have waste. Um, you know, or at least have minimal waste as possible, so we don't forget. Uh, right, number two, can you identify three measures other than the use of the first in, first out system that can be used to maintain the quality and prevent spoilage of supplies? So, 
in this case you could be uh, you know the main thing is when you are getting any deliveries that you are firstly checking your items before you accept them make sure that they have the good uh, quality that they, you're asking for the the right brands um, the you know it has a good amount of expiry date meaning that it's got a good duration so it's not expiring tomorrow um, what else that it's not damaged in any way or anything like that you're also you know regularly cleaning and rearranging your storage areas you're maintaining the hygiene processes in there making sure there are, are no pests that can live in there and damage your product you're also uh, making sure to check on your products regularly meaning that even though you might not be using that product often if you go and check those items you can see you know if it's been damaged or um, if any rodents have gotten into it by any chance or anything like that okay so complete that and then come back and we can resume to the next one so 3.1 regularly check perishable supplies for quality so the quality of perishable supplies may relate to the currency of best before or used by dates freshness size and weight so degradation of flavor aroma color and texture basic checks should be performed to ensure that there hasn't been any deterioration or in degradation of your perishable supplies such supplies should have the same qual um, qualities as when they are originally delivered to your premises however you may notice that foods have developed a sour taste or slimy texture the fresh smell of perishable fruits and vegetables may also have been lost as a consequence of spoilage so enzymic browning the browning process may affect a range of perishable fruits and vegetables it involves the production of an enzyme called polyphenol oxidase resulting in development of a browned appearance it is quite likely that brown ingredients will retain their desirable taste um, however you should avoid including them in any dishes for aesthetic reasoning so meaning if you're using them for colors or anything like that you won't get any bright colors from them and it won't look nice but the browning doesn't necessarily take the taste away but it just won't have that fresh smell or maybe the look is won't be there alright mold it should be very easy to identify the presence of mold or on your perishable supplies such supplies may take on a blue or green appearance and have a furry texture the odor texture and flavor of such food is likely to be negatively affected in some instances it might be possible to remove the mold and use the ingredients in your cooking however you should be aware of the risks associated with certain types of mold alright activity 3a identify and provide short descriptions of five processes which may have negative impacts on the quality of perishable supplies so the five processes will be your mold your uh, enzymic browning so or you could just say browning um, the degradation of flavor um, the degradation of the aroma and the color and texture and you also you know might so essentially you're checking the um, the flavor of the item regularly if it tastes different then obviously it's not going to give you the desired outcome it might not smell fresh it might have a different color that you then you expect it might also have a different texture it might feel too soft or not heavy enough or might taste sour or develop a slimy texture if we're thinking about browning you might have a you know you essentially won't look the same if it hasn't um, if your product hasn't gone too far in deterioration it won't be affecting the taste but it won't have a nice look okay because it's been oxidized so it will, if you're going to use it for presentation we wouldn't recommend it because it'll look brown it won't give you that colorful look if you're looking for mold 
you know, your taste will be negatively affected. The odor, meaning the smell, the texture. Um, you could also think about um, using it in your cooking, but it just depends on what the item is. But I wouldn't recommend it. If the mold is, you know, excessive, I wouldn't recommend it. It also depends on where the mold is. If it's on top of the plastic wrap, okay, fine. It's not in your item. But if it's in your item, how far has it gone? If it's gone through the center of it, it most likely is starting to spread and you can't use it. But if it may be starting at a corner, you could isolate that and still use maybe 80% of that packet. All right, so... Yeah, so we got negative impacts and so your things such as browning, spoilage, um, losing color, losing taste, forming a slimy texture um, might be um, losing the way it feels, so it might not have the weight of it, might not feel sturdy, okay, meaning like it might feel you know a little bit of floppy like when you feel a cucumber that's a bit old it's not rigid it's not um, it doesn't hold its shape it just flops around because now the liquid is starting to give all right might give off slime might give a bad odor um, not give you the color it might start browning it might have mold it might have um, you know pests and signs of pests um, eating at it or uh, damaging the product you might have chemicals on it so there's so many there that will degrade your items so include five in, I've given you more than five but if you have any of your own ideas you can include those as well alright so complete that once you're done come back and we can move on to the next one so 3.2 inspect items for animal and pest damage and report incidents of infestation Inspecting items. There are numerous signs which might indicate that pests have entered your premises and come into contact with your perishable supplies. You might notice that food packages have been unexpectedly tampered with or ripped open. These, uh, the pests might have been, um, uh, might have also left droppings. If you have any reasonable uh, suspicion that pests have come into contact with packaging then you must uh, you know you should discard it immediately and then uh, call pest control additional signs of infestation could be presence of live or dead pests holes or webbing on food packaging larvae or uh, pupae on shelves and sills pests caught in traps um, yeah, so you don't want to see any baby cockroaches or dead rats anywhere. So if you see them, then you know they've already gotten into your stuff. Uh, reporting pests. Your organization should have established procedures when regarding um, reporting of pests. You may be expected to inform a facilities or catering manager. Your organization may also have a logbook, which can be used whenever pests are identified. Uh, these should include details of who saw or identified the signs of pests. It should also highlight the time of the sighting and any follow-up actions that have been taken. Alright, so identify five potential signs of pest infestation. Alright, there's so many, but you could see damaged products, you could see actual pests in the um, area, you could see feces meaning poop or you could see um, larvae or pupae on the shelves or on um, the floor you could see dead pests um, you could see the pests in the traps you could see damaged products that have maybe bite marks or uh, webs or some sort of poop around them so you know that they are around or trying to get into your foods um, yeah, so you could see maybe ants, you could see cockroaches, you could see rats, anything small you'll see trying to get into your food that is not sealed properly. Um, if you've got windows open, you might have external pests coming in like birds trying to find food 
or you could have like um, in Australia we've got possums and um, cats, feral cats and dogs and things like that that might try and get into your food preparation area. So you want to have your food preparation area sealed as tightly as possible. Alright, so complete that, um, come back when you're ready and we can move to the next one. So 3.3 Identify deficiencies and report findings or dispose of any non-usable supplies within scope of own responsibility. And 3.4, safely dispose of spoiled stock and waste to minimize negative environmental impacts. So deficiencies may include contaminated food, food that is intended to be frozen but has thawed, chilled, um, but has reached a dangerous temperature zone, so we're looking at the danger zone between 5 and 60. Uh, packaged food that has been exposed through damaged packaging. Kitchen waste and hazardous uh, substances may include any used or out-of-date ingredients or items such as cooking oils, dry goods, fruit and vegetables, meat products, and any cleaning agents or chemicals. Environmentally friendly measures include purchasing reduced quantities of food to minimize the amount of waste, restricting the purchase of foods contained in packages which may cause environmental harm, separating general waste recycling and composting, and maintaining a cleaning um, schedule and dustbins and designated waste areas. Alright, give four examples of deficiencies that may be identified in relation to perishable supplies. So essentially, we're looking at contaminated food, um, we're looking at frozen food that has been thawed or chilled food that has been in the danger zone, so danger zone meaning the temperature zone which is between 5 degrees and 60 degrees, and packaged food that has been exposed through damaged packaging. Alright, specify five types of kitchen waste and hazardous substances. So, you know, you've got your grease, oils, um, your ingredients that are out of date such as fruit and vegetables, meat products, seafood. Seafood is very hazardous when it's out of date. Uh, any chemicals or cleaning agents as well. Alright, now give three examples of environmentally friendly wastage management measures. So we want to be um, maintaining and cleaning dustbins and designated waste areas. We want to be separating general waste, recycling and composting and making sure that we you know, do that on a regular basis and all staff are trained. We make sure restricting the purchase of foods you know, contained in packages which may cause environmental harm. So we don't want to buy a lot of items that come in plastic or um, harmful packaging. Okay. And Ultimately, we want to purchase um, reduced quantities of food to minimize waste. Um, we might reduce our serving size. We might give um, takeaways to staff so we don't produce a lot of waste, depending on our business. All right, so complete those. And as this is the last activity, I'm hoping you have completed your workbook. So forward it on, email it to your trainers. If you've got anything wrong or if there are any issues, they will let you know so you can fix them. If not, uh, congrats, you're done with this part of your uh, unit. I suggest that you go on to your multiple choice now and start completing that. It will be made available on your student portal. Um, and we have three assessments after this, which is the skill knowledge and performance so your trainer will guide you um, to when they intend to conduct those and they will you know essentially tell you when it will be done keep an eye on your timetable so you um, you know when it's done what dates and time frames that this will be conducted if you have any questions um, please don't hesitate to ask your trainer or me if you see us in person or email us um, if you like my email is admin at wisemaneducation.com.au If you um, have any questions or feedback, don't hesitate to email me or just tell me in person. Um, yeah, so 
if um, you have any issues with this unit or you want to revisit any sections you're more than welcome to this will be available in your student portal and uh, hopefully um, you've got all the information that you need so you'll be able to successfully complete the unit so hopefully I'll see you on the next one